Hi everybody, I am David Butler. I'm Emily Freeman. Greetings. This is Don't Miss This. I just really wanted to say greetings today, and I did. So before we jump into Jacob, which our, uh, he's our next prophet, our next book of the book. For those who are new and asking about these papers that are up here, they're all, here's one right here. Yay! They're all bound together in our study journal, which is now in the stores for those who've been waiting. So this is the study They're journal. They're so happy about that. Pages yeah, for notes and everything that just goes along with every single lesson. And you can fill it in at church. And oh, I was really close to the camera <laughs> when I said that. Oh, and the devotional book is. <laughs> I'm so glad all these, what else? What other trends? It's like the Mary, know, there's a Mary Poppins exactly shelf. There's like. a Mary Poppins shelf that's right there. The devotional book that you can just use for one verse a day. I, this is so fun to hear how many people are using this and liking it. That makes us super And happy. if you wonder what you're going to find in there, that is not meant to be like a, a heavy reference guide. Um, it's like culture and context and application. And it's just a short Little stories. Read. Yep. That your kids kind of will enjoy. And it just gives you something to talk about and think it's about. It's what we do for scripture study every night. And it's awesome. And do you know that our kids, um, my kids, we're not married, if you're new. Hi. Um, my kids try to guess who wrote each one, oh, whether it was you or me. They're oh like, they don't them. don't tell us. And then at the end, they, they try good? to guess. Yeah, they're getting good. Okay. They're getting super good. Oh, but cool. it's hard enough, and that makes me happy, too. When it says my husband, Greg, they immediately It's a giveaway. It's fun. <laughs> Even though I'd marry Greg. He's okay. such an awesome we dude. We do love Greg. Okay. Jacob 1 through 4, y'all, new prophet right now, which is super exciting. And say what you told your seminary class. Okay, so this is fun. so fun. I told my seminary class this week because we're doing Jacob 1 through 4 right now. And I said, this is your introduction to Jacob right now. We're just, we're really going to get to know him. We've heard a little bit from him previously, but now we really get to know the personality of Jacob. So I gave them an invitation that when I get back next week for seminary, they are going to teach me everything I want to know about who Jacob is. Like, introduce me to Jacob. So that's kind of how you want to enter into this. What's his personality? What's his writing style? What does he worry about? What is he passionate about? Um, you a little bit love, at least I do, that he's so anxious about things. Like, he, he keeps telling you, I have a lot of anxiety about these things. And you just love that he loves his people so much that he's just worried about him. And he's he just has this fire and this enthusiasm of teaching and leading and yeah it's fun that like we get this like we saw a personality of president monson and we see a personality of president nelson i was talking to spency my nephew the other day and he was like i i, I like reading what joseph smith said i really wish i could meet him and mm -hmm. like what's his personality yes. like and yeah. i was listening to saints and it was saying a little bit about his personality and you kind of get that a little bit in here from jacob where you just like what's cool about him is um he didn't ever live in jerusalem so he's born out already after the family left out in the wilderness so he's never known what that city looks like or yeah, what it's only like. known he's, the wilderness right that's it and he's, what they have now. isn't that crazy he's yeah. never known a city well he does now because they've built them mm -hmm. and stuff like that but like it's just wild to think about that's his perspective of the yeah. world and everything so he is our best guy the book of jacob the brother of nephi oh we're so happy um, okay, what are we starting first with? Which this? is five, because you just love when he starts out and says, For because of faith and great anxiety, it truly had been made manifest unto us concerning our people what should happen unto them. So you love that not just having faith and what needed to be taught, but he actually has a lot of concern and anxiety for the welfare of everyone. And he spends a lot of time praying and trying to receive revelation which I think of, is kinda, what do I need? Which is really cool because you, there might be some dads or moms or friends out there who really worry about somebody. And it's neat that worry can become a catalyst for revelation. Mm. That I'm really concerned about what's going to happen for you. And that kind of desperation opens up the door to heaven, which I think is, is kind of cool. Yeah, and I neat. really like that part. So we're going to start out... Okay, let me just say this too. We've gotten a lot of comments from all of you about the board, so we're gonna try something a little bit different. Oh, oh just As move. we go, no, oh. we're not gonna move. Surprise! Oh. <laughs> Laura's gonna stay here, but as we go through the board, we're really gonna try and take time and, and let you know what is written back here, and we'll push him out of the way, and oh, we'll me? move what? too oh. when it is time. <laughs> so we're gonna try and help you figure out what you need from the board. Yeah, this matches up with what's in the study journal, so those it's for those who are trying to fill it out and 
sorry that we're not. We're going to be better about showing we're you be where better. the right. We are. That's our goal. So we're going to start out in verse 7 of Jacob 1, which we love because this is his beginning. This is like um, what he wants you to know. And this is going to sound really similar to Nephi, his brother. In verse 7, he says, Wherefore, we labor diligently among our people that we might persuade them. And then he's going to give us a list of the things they were persuading the people to do it. You remember when Nephi said that same thing in 2 Nephi uh, 25. 26, yeah, 25. 25. I remember it because it's Christmas. Yeah, because we labor it. diligently yeah. to persuade our children. And remember when he talks about the exact same thing. So that was really firm on Nephi's mind at the end of his life. And as Jacob takes over this ministry, it's also how he begins. He's like, this, let me tell you what I want to persuade you to know. Almost like there was a conversation between the two of them before he died. Yeah. You know, like it yes. just makes you think there's no record of it, but maybe there was this, you know, sit down where Nephi was like, listen, I've lived my whole life. And let me just tell you something, you know, what, mm -hmm. what I saw the most benefit was, was to try and persuade people. You know, to do these yeah. things. This and, if, is... and as you're a parent and as you're thinking, or if you're a Sunday school teacher and you, you're thinking about your class or whatever your calling is, the people you minister to, I love that this becomes a really good le list, even for like a ward council. This is what he was focused on to try and help his people live better. And so just to think about each of these things. So we're going to show these two as we go. Um, as we come here, and you're going to find them in verses seven and verses eight. This is chapter one, and they're and in your seven list and is eight. right here, and we've written it right here. So the first one is they're going to persuade them to come unto Christ, to partake of His goodness, to enter His rest, um, not to rebel, which I think is so interesting, to believe in Christ, to view His death, and to suffer the cross and bear the shame. So let's talk a little bit about. Like, what, what does that even mean? What is he talking about there? And what would that look like in our lives and in our homes? If you were to go through and talk about, some of them are easy. Like, to come unto Christ, we talk about that all the time. What are ways you can help your kids or your class or your neighbors or the people who are struggling come unto Christ? And we would say it in a way I think that's most helpful is like, how do you want to strengthen your relationship with him mm. or kind of spend time with him? Like, that would be the... Yep. And I, I to believe in Christ also. Right. Those kind of will go, um, you know, hand in hand with each other. It's interesting because just as we were preparing, um, we received this email from uh, President Nelson. We didn't, don't think we all of a sudden got a real life email. You got it too, Wait, everybody. I, but I feel like I got it because I got it before my friend when I got it earlier and I told him. It was Daisy and I was like, oh, I just got an email from President Nelson. He's like, I didn't get one. And I was like, well... Okay, he just likes we all me. got one. And there are a couple things he said in here that I think were important. Um, Look, you have a phone and I don't right now. How about that? Mm -hmm. um, so this is what he said, brothers and sisters, in the scriptures, there are very few sacred instances in which the voice of God the Father has been heard. So when he says something, we really need to listen. And repeatedly, he has personally introduced his beloved son, Jesus Christ, with a specific charge to hear him which I love that um, that's, how, that's what he wants us to know. As you think about how we worship and some of the things that happen in our life, and we actually got a couple emails recently where people talked about um, how do you differentiate God the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost? And sometimes it's hard to tell which one you're talking about and who do we pray to? And those are all really important questions. And I think he sets up something here that is important for us to remember, which is God the Father only speaks um, just in a few instances in the scriptures. We are mostly hearing from the teaching of the Son as we go through. Uh, particularly this year, you will notice we have talked a lot about Jesus Christ because the Book of Mormon is another witness of Jesus Christ. So that is going to be mostly our focus of our conversations is how do we come closer to Jesus Christ? It's because it's what like the particular like? mission of the book, right. right? This book in particular is designed to bring us closer to Christ. And I like that he says in his email, this is cool, that this came at a really good time. Um, he says, he pleads with us to listen to the voice of Jesus Christ, whom the Father anointed and appointed as our mediator, Savior, and Redeemer. And he's like, that's that's why, because coming, you come unto the Father 
by and through yeah. him and his name. And so that's why there's this emphasis, yeah. you know, in this book particularly. And I love that Jacob is going to tell us two things there. I, you need to figure out how to come unto Christ. And you also need to figure out how to believe in Christ. What does that look like? How do you strengthen a relationship with Jesus Christ? Um, how does that happen? And, and Jacob is going to help us to know how to do that. He's going to give us ideas of how to, good, how to do that. I love the second one he says is to partake of the goodness of God. And I've thought a lot about that um, this week because we live in a culture um, where what we hear most often, I think, and maybe it's just my world, maybe it's just the place where I live, is people who want to complain about what religion looks like in their life right now. It, it feels like that is a topic of discussion that I hear regularly um, in of the places wrong. where I am of what's wrong with um, with the church right now and what isn't working and why did they do it this way and I thought to myself it's so interesting that Jacob's like do, do you want to just think about the goodness of God sometimes like should we be talking about that in our conversations around the dinner table um, where has God been good to you lately where have you received an answer to a prayer um, where have you seen a tender mercy or a miracle working in your life or in the lives of the people that you know? And do we spend enough time talking about his goodness? And also I love the invitation to partake of the goodness. Partake means to like eat it, to not just maybe first to observe it, but then like let it be a part mm. of your life, like yeah. experience it. Don't just know it, but experience it. And saying that next one, enter into his rest. Um, it says that you might enter into his rest, like eventually, but I also think that could be an invitation for enter into his rest means to enter into his presence. Mm. And there are lots of ways that we could yep. enter into, you know, his, into his presence mm -hmm. and feel his companionship. Oh, which and I you think just feel great. that whisper of an invitation to the temple right there, right? Mm -hmm. Just that place where we go and we, we actually feel that rest. I like when it says believe next to rebel, that those two are next to each other in verse eight. Yeah. Because it's it's almost like let's persuade people to not rebel against God. Um, it's okay to like question and wonder. That's not what he's saying. Mm -hmm. But he says, Don't choose to rebel and turn your back and fight, but maybe choose to believe oh, instead. So good. I just was I was like driving the other day and I was th I just had this impression where I was like, I, I need to teach my kids what it means to choose to believe. Mm -hmm. That just came really strong. And I've just been talking to Jenny. When do we, you know, when should we talk about this with them and, and just help them see like, this is an actual choice to like, I've got to choose on some, maybe every day, I'm going to choose to believe. I'm going to choose to believe that he's good. And I'm going to choose to believe the best in people and in him. And Which is so cool. important. I can remember being in um, St. George several years ago. And in St. George, there's a little gate. Have we talked about this before? Um, it's kind of like the one that's in France that you can buy a lock and you go and you put really? the lock there. Yeah, it oh. really is. It's just exactly the same. I don't know how to tell you how to get there, so don't ask me. But ask someone <laughs> in St. George and they will tell you where it is. St. George is about to get swarmed uh, with uh, locks. That is so true because it's just this fence. And you, you go there and it's like a love gate. That is what it is. It tells you that on there. And you commit your love to someone with that lock. That's what you're going to do. Well, I was with all my nieces who were little, like 10 and 11 and 9. And we walked and past it. It was the first time <laughs> I had seen it. And I love stuff like that. So I, I was like, everybody, we have to just stop here and look at this. And then one of my nieces was like, I just want to put a lock on the gate. And I did too. I wanted to put a lock on the gate. And then I was like, you know what? We are going to choose who we are going to love right now. And it is going to be Jesus Christ. We, right now, we are going to say, we are going to commit to choose Jesus for the rest of our life today at this gate. And so we walked over to the hardware store and we bought locks. We walked back to that gate and we hooked all of ours together. So if you go there and you see five locks all hooked together, Unless the guy takes them off once a year and they start over fresh. But if not, don't tell your nieces. In the top left hand side of that gate, you are going to see five locks all hooked together in one. And, um, and that was our commitment. We are going to choose Christ for the rest of our life. We all, everyone committed. We all took a little second and committed. <laughs> and um, I think to myself, you know what? All those girls are still so strong in the church, but if they ever weren't, I would just drive to St. George. 
and I would just stand right in front of that gate because I love what he's saying is choose him. Like I want to persuade you to believe in Christ and, and just say right now, I'm not going to rebel against God. Just make the choice right now. I'm not going to. I, I see that other people will. The scriptures even tell me that's going to happen. I'm not going to be one of those people. I'm just going to decide right now I'm not going to rebel against God and I'm going to choose to believe in Christ every day for the rest of my life. And I, and I think it really is important that somebody that we that we recognize and say that it's okay if you're just if you were to say in prayer I just imagine myself saying I, I don't know why you're doing this and I don't understand this and this part of our culture frustrates me. Oh, I love that. But I'm choosing to believe in you. And, and, and I think he gives us a hint in the next one in how to do it, which is he says, view is death, mm. right? Like, look to the cross. Look to what he was willing to lay down for you. Like, we can choose him because he's already chosen us. That when you look to him on the cross, you're just like, I didn't know someone loved me that much. Um, if you were willing, you know, to bear the pain and the, and the sufferings of that for me, then maybe I can bear the questions and the wonderings and the confusion for you. And I think that is important to address because sometimes we are so passionate about this topic um, that everybody is going to have questions. Things are going to come up in your life. We've hopefully. had a we lot We would say of, hopefully. Yeah, like our, our yeah, foundation had, story is a boy with a question. Yes, it like is. We want it to be. And we've had a lot of conversations where we're like, okay, tell me what you think about this. But it's interesting because um, for me, there are a lot of times when I, when I will learn something or I will hear something and I will read something and I will say, this doesn't make sense to me. And then I'll go back to exactly what we're talking about. But I believe in Christ. I believe this is his church. So I'm going to enter in knowing those two things. And then I'm going to say to Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, with those two things in mind, help me understand and and some things I don't learn in one day sometimes I can't just go to the scriptures and there's the answer right there maybe most things um, sometimes it, it takes months once my neighbor Tasha and I argued about something for eight years that we were trying to question and figure out and and it took that long it took eight years to finally come to a resolution of that thing but I believed in Christ the whole time because I love Christ, and I think you're right. Why do I love him? Because I know what he did. I love that it says that. Just view his death. Just remember what he did for you. And suffer his cross, take up his cross, and bear the shame of the world or Meaning the questions or the doubt or yeah. the things that you don't understand. Yeah. Like, that you're just, I just like that Like right after it, it says, just expect that part of choosing him is going to cause suffering and part of choosing him is going to cause giving up things and part of choosing mm -hmm. him is going to mean being different than other people sometimes we're not trying to be deliberately different from people but it just is gonna happen yep and choosing christ doesn't mean your life will be easy from that moment forward right but that's what he tells you just so you know this doesn't mean it's going to be easy but um it does mean it will be different, and I think it will be better. Mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine doing life without Jesus Christ by my side. And we've had hard, hard things that I think would have been harder had he not been part of that journey. So I am grateful for that, and I love what he's teaching here, and I think it would be neat as a parent to take some time and look at each of your kids and think, which of these things do my kids need to know more about right now? Um, and how can I persuade Yeah, and how them? can I persuade them? Megan and Tyson the other night came over for dinner, and I walked into the kitchen counter, and I just said to them, okay, before we even eat, before we do anything, this is something I used to do with my kids all the time when they were in high school, promise me right now you're not going to leave the church. And Megan um, said promise right off the bat because she just knows I used to do that to my kids all the time. <laughs> promise me right now you're not going to look at pornography. Promise me right now whatever that thing was and it was an ongoing joke at our house. It was just regular but I was like I just I just want to be having that like reminder and if you do that's fine because we're going to figure it out which we did talk about that after but Tyson was like 
why are you telling us to promise that? That is so weird. Like, what made you think of that? Why, why did you walk in here and say, promise you're not going to leave the church? Do you know something? And I was like, <laughs> no, I don't. But I sometimes just want to have that day every so often when you're like, hey, just today, re-engage. Like, just say to yourself, I'm in this. I'm going to believe in Christ. I just, let's, should we have that conversation at the calendar every so often of just remember this is what we do. And even in the hard parts, come over, sit at the counter. Let's talk about what the hard parts are. But can you just believe in Christ? That's what I want for you in your life is that. And to, ha- and to be having those conversations, which I think is what Jacob is doing right here. Yeah. And, and we love that that's how he's going to take this, this new calling or responsibility mm-hmm. or whatever has been given to him to do. We don't have much on here about this but can we just pause in verse 17 for a second before we go on to something else because i love that verse where jacob just says i i um i'm gonna preach this sermon at the temple because this is an this is an errand that i obtained from the lord i think that is just so rad that his whole ministry is rooted in i just want to do what whatever errands God's going to give me to do. And, and you he's like, love, this is my particular one. And you love that um, he's going to talk about it in 19 and also in Second Jacob, Jacob 2, verse 2. Um, he's going to talk about, and we did magnify our office. We took upon us our responsibility. And in verse 2, he's going to say that again. And we did, ma- I did magnify my office. Um, it would be neat to just stop and contemplate that also at this time. What What is your errand right now from the Lord? What is it? And how could you magnify that? And what does magnify even mean? Like, it's awesome to look up that definition and think about what does magnify mean? Because it's going to, you're going to be enlarged, right? You're going to see details of what you need to be doing right now. That, that word magnify is such a great word for what the Lord can do through his grace for us in mm. our life. So to take a little bit of time and just think about that. What is your errand? What, um, is, what is your office? What do you need the Lord to magnify in you right now? That is so good. So his particular errand right now is to go preach this sermon <laughs> to mm. the people at the temple. And I wish we still did sermons at the temple. I guess we kind of do them at general conferences across the street. But don't you want to sit on the steps of the temple all 16 million of us <laughs> and whoever else and just hear a sermon and he is sort of sad to give this sermon he says because he's like oh i just wish i could talk about something different i really want to talk about something different but the lord is kind of pressing upon me to speak about this it reminds me of um president oaks when uh, when was that 2005 or something where he gave a talk I on pornography that. And then his next talk that he spoke, was it a conference or a BYU devotional where he, he said someone came up to him and said, hey, I really enjoyed your talk. And his response was, I didn't. <laughs> like, I didn't want to give it, but I felt, yes. you know, pressed, yeah. you know, to address like a really tough issue. And and that's kind of what it seems like he's having to do right here. I love in chapter 2 in verse 5, um, he says this as he as he gets ready to do that. And again, I think this is such a such great counsel for a parent. He says, I, I can tell concerning your thoughts how you are beginning to labor in sin. And I love that he's that aware of what's going on. And for us as parents, I love the thought of him saying, I'm not going to wait until this becomes a big problem for you because I'm going to talk to you about this because I can, I can see this is just beginning in you. So let's, let's start figuring this out right now before you get too much farther. And he wants to talk about two problems, right? He's going to say there, so there's two problems here. So we have a spot right here, here, two concerns, and we and put them right, right here. here. Um, and number two is going to be interesting to you if you know this chapter. One is going to be pretty simple. Um, you can find it in verse 13 where he says this. It starts by saying, look, God's been so good to us, and we've gotten a lot of riches, and some of you more than other people. But then he says, here's the problem. Because of that. Some of you have been lifted up in the pride of your hearts and you have high heads because of the costliness of your apparel and you persecute your brethren because, and I think this is the actual problem, not that you have more, but because you suppose that you are better than they are and that you're persecuting people. I think you're going to find with both these problems that they result in hurting other people. Mm. And that seems to be the gravity of the issue. It's just like, 
the fact that you think you're better is probably not a good idea. But the fact that you're now putting other people down and condemning and persecuting, I think that's where the issue actually is. So then just a lot of great advice on, on how do you recenter your heart on riches? How do you recenter your heart on gifts, on the way that you're living and your relationship with other people? Like yep. And you all love the way that through. that antidote to pride is in verses 17, 18, and 19. And it would be interesting to pull those out with your kids and just see what's he talking about. Because he's, he's, he says, I want you to think of your brethren like yourselves. I want you to be familiar with them. I want mm. you to give them of what you have um, and to build the kingdom of God. I mean, what if every morning we all just woke up and we were like, how can I build the kingdom today? How can I do good what, in what verse 19? Yeah. yeah, I love that one. Um, and that, and he's talking about look, right? Clothe the naked, feed the hungry, liberate the captive, administer relief to the sick and the afflicted. I was actually just thinking about this this week because I think it is so interesting that he tells us, like he's really specific. What do you, what are we supposed to do with naked people? Clothe them. What are we supposed to do with the hungry people? Feed them. Like he's like, do you see the need and answer the need, right? Don't give a drink to someone who doesn't have any clothes to wear and is freezing outside. They need clothes. <laughs> That's what they need right now. Um, but I love that right here he really is teaching what he did so well, which was meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. Like see where they are. And then answer the need of the condition they are in. I love 17 when he says to be free with your substance. That substance doesn't necessarily have to be money either. Mm. Be free with whatever it is that you have that can make other people rich. Yeah. Is that hope? Is that encouragement? Is that... It could be so many time? different things. Yeah, yeah time. I mean, like You just think about like one of the things that I love about my cute friend Chris that we've talked about probably will forever because I just miss her and talking about her helps me remember her, but it was her time. She just had time for people. Free with it. And She's she was free so it. free with it that you just love, like, what is the thing you have a lot of right now? How could you give that thing? Whatever it is. Yeah, maybe you could think for just a second, like, I feel like I'm really rich in my life because of, and that can maybe start giving you ideas. Mm -hmm. Like you think of other people who yeah, I love free that with idea. you. That's so good. So there's the problem and there's the antidote that's the to it. That's the first one. Um, it really is the, the heart and soul. That's the second great commandment. And I mm -hmm. think that's why it's such a big deal to yeah. him. He's just like, no, listen, people matter. You, you, you got to be good. You know, to mm -hmm. people. Oh, can I just say this real fast? Because yes. I had this idea the other day. I was like, oh my gosh. I was, put, I was putting away um, chairs at church the other day. And I was just like thinking about like all the people were helping and stuff. And I was like, this is good service, but not my favorite service. And then I turned to the guy next to me. And I was like, if our ward was in some inner city somewhere, I think I'd convince the ward to serve breakfast to the homeless before church every Sunday. What ward is doing that? Don't you think that'd be so fun? If we did it in Lehigh, no one would come. Just the deacons <laughs> who want a cinnamon roll. But don't you think it'd be awesome yes. if you were just like, our ward I do. feeds the hungry every... Don't do it fast Sunday because you want to join in. But, you know, yes. that'd be so awesome. It would be okay, so awesome. Okay, now big number, big number two um, is in verse uh, 23. 23. Oh, this one is so interesting. You think you know what it's going to be already because you've read the first part of Jacob and you're like, I know what number two is. Um, and don't worry, we're going to get there. But you're you're kind of surprised because what he says, you're like, wait, that's it? That was the problem? In verse 23, it says, The word of God burdens me because of your grosser crimes. For behold, thus saith the Lord, this people began, again, there it is again. It, mm -hmm. You're just beginning. You to wax. begin to wax. <gasps> Who loves that you're going to address the problem before the wax hardens? That's awesome. Yeah, that is so awesome. In iniquity. And then here's the problem. They understand not the scriptures. Okay, we could just stop right there. That, there's going to be a problem that comes because they don't understand the scriptures. But really, if you were to look at most of the problems in the world right now, most of the issues people are struggling with, it's interesting because I think for most of them, you could come back and say, oh, I see what you are struggling with. And part of the problem is you don't understand scriptures mm -hmm. that's where you've got to come back into is is what what would the scriptures teach you about that thing it's so interesting because we're so quick to go 
to the easy place for the answer. What, wherever the answer is going to come the easiest, that's where I'm going to go. And I noticed too, just as you talk with people who are struggling so often, they reach out to people maybe who have left because they don't want to ask people here because they don't want to freak people out here. So they're, they go here because they're like, just tell me what you think about this. Um, sometimes we go to people. Sometimes we go to the internet. We spend time on Facebook. We look at what other people are talking about on Facebook that has to do with this thing. We Google things. And it's so interesting that Jacob's like, okay, let me tell you problem number two. You don't understand the scriptures. Like, take your questions in here. And maybe it's true. Maybe it's hard to understand the scriptures. Maybe the answer you're looking for, you're like, I would like to go to the scriptures, but I don't know where to go in the scriptures to find the answer to that. And what I want to say is find someone who does. The Lord will put someone in your path who would know where to find that answer in the scriptures and go to that person. And the second thing I want to say about that is we need to become more trustworthy as people. We need to become the type of people that someone would dare to come to us and say, mm. I have a question about this thing. And can you sit with me for a minute and just like, where would I go look for this in the scriptures? Where would I find this? Where would you suggest I should go? Um, how do we make it so people feel safe entering into those conversations? We need to build that community. Yeah, I this reminded me of something that I'm trying to think of where I read it from just in studying restoration things that kind of, um, oh, present, I think, shoot, where um, the principle's true, but it's, um, I can't remember where I read it, is not to be like that. Remember Joseph Smith takes the, his vision and takes it to the, you know, mm -hmm. someone he thought he could trust and they kind of reject it and push it down. And it, the invitation was don't be like that person for other people. Mm. And like instead just sit and listen and what what is it that you want to that you want to say? That's what that reminded me of. Yeah, I love that. I, remember that book we loved so much that everything I ever needed to know I learned in kindergarten mm -hmm. and I just kind of think that about the scriptures. Like, what if you said the same thing? Just like, what's in there that could help you get through or answer a problem? To understand God's character, to understand your divine nature, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is like, I, I bet we could like solve all the world wars if we would just like, <laughs> understand you know, do something scripture. like this. Yeah, you know? and how do you... Um, how do you get through hard things? How do you find answers? How do you get through the middle places? How do you, like every question that you have, there's probably an answer here. And it's just figuring out how do we help each other turn to the scriptures first and more often. And I was just looking at this because the particular problem that is rampant among Jacob's people at the time is, um, is chastity problems, right? They're immoral. And, and it's cool that as he addresses it, how many times I keep seeing, saith the Lord, mm. thus saith the Lord, for I, the Lord God, I, the Lord, I love that for I will, saith the Lord. I love that Jacob is going back to the words of the Lord in yeah. addressing the problem. He's not he's saying like, what he thinks. Right. He's like, this could, I bet you could, here's the solution to your immorality problem. God already taught it. So let's talk about that. And let's, mm -hmm. and let's look at those things. I think it's a. Are, are really, it's a beautiful approach, which kind of leads us into um, this advice that he's going to give. Should we do this advice first or the anthem advice first? Yeah, let's do Jonathan. anthem first, and then let's go to these two um, second. Um, I think those will be good together. Okay, there's this um, pastor who, um, if you look in chapter 3, I love verse 11, chapter 3, verse 11, where he's just like, okay, my brethren, which I think is so rad that, Jacob is putting himself on that same playing field as the rest of them. He was like, you struggle with immorality and maybe I have, and, or maybe I've struggled with this other thing, but we're, we're brothers and sisters in this, you know? Mm -hmm. And he says, listen, do you, it's only this, we love this idea of a mm -hmm. fight song. He's like, yeah. arouse the faculty, shake yourself, loose yourself from the pains of hell. And like, let's just, let's go. He like has this like, fight this what do you call that a fight cry yeah. <laughs> it's not even a real life thing you know but we have this pastor that we really like his name is john piper on the paper you can see a website where you can find this 
where he's taken some scriptural principles and battling in particular, he's talking about battling immorality and immoral thoughts, but it could be a, a fight song or an anthem um, uh, for any sort of like temptation that a person might be fighting. Yeah, I love the thought of like taking this and putting it right by every computer in your home, wherever it is, because what I love most about it is that moment particularly if you have a child who struggles with pornography or something where they just need a reminder of like, when I get into this situation, this is, this is what I need to do. This is what needs to happen for me. Um, any addiction, really, that you struggle yeah. with, this would be so good. Um, and it's cool that he, you could pull scripture stories from every single one of these things. It's where it's yeah. in the scriptures that he's getting these principles and how to battle this, which is just awesome. So it's Anthem, and what do you call those things when they- I was just gonna say, what is the name of that It's not one? anagram, yeah, it's, it's a, a, we don't, You'll all know, you'll all email <laughs> Everybody us. listening right now yeah. is saying like, it's a, <laughs> no, anthem. don't email us. We just, we'll, we'll, we'll look it up in a second. Um, that all the letters of the word represent things to kind of help you remember. And it's cool that it's Anthem because it's kind of like this fight song. Yeah. So this is what he says. The first thing is A, avoid the situation. Like if you know that is a place that gets you in trouble, just avoid it at all costs. But we all know that doesn't always work every single time. And, that, and I love that he's like, and that's okay because if, if by chance you get yourself in that situation, the next thing you're gonna do is say no within five minutes. Seconds. And I mean seconds. That's what, I was like, that's a long time. I was like, why are you thinking about it so long? <laughs> five seconds. You like that I corrected you yes. within five milliseconds. Yes, I do. <laughs> within five seconds. And I love that because he it is like he wants no to be an instant and immediate response. For don't you. even let it dwell within your mind. Yeah. Right? Remember when the Savior talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, yeah. don't let it dwell. Yeah, don't even think about it. Don't visualize it. Don't focus on it. Don't let it become part of what's happening there. In five seconds, you say no. But then I love that he's like, that's not going to be enough. Yeah. And T-H-E, I think all three of them, really, they all go together, but these three in particular. The T is turn your mind to Christ. Like get a new thought. Like you have this idea, temptation, whatever. And he says, instead, turn your mind to a thought of Christ. And in his explanation, he talks about pick like a particular scene or his words or yeah. Picture him some, I love, in some way. I love telling my seminary kids when I teach this, right now decide what that thing is. That you just know this works every time when I want to think about Jesus Christ. It might be a song that you love that you keep on your phone for moments like this. It could be a protection scripture. We've talked about that a lot. Just a phrase that you're like, okay, this is. I'm saying no in five seconds and then my mind is going to go to my protection scripture or to this song or it might be a picture or yeah, like, mine's, what is it? Decide right now. Mine's just the image of Christmas morning. Oh. Like for some reason, like not my own Christmas morning, even though I love that, but <laughs> just Mary and Joseph and the baby. Like that scene like captures my heart every single time. I love like that. Like without fail. And the H's hold on to that image. Like hold on. And it, so it's got to be emotionally compelling enough that you would want Mm -hmm. to hold on to it and then enjoy what it is that Christ offers. What is it that you're being taught in, you know, in that song or that scripture or that picture about him and enjoy it. Like love mm -hmm. that he offers and gives that and let that satisfy your soul. Yeah, it's, it just is going to help you do a mind shift. And all of this is supposed to happen in like, I mean, just fast. This is the, you don't do this for 20 minutes because M is going to be and move. Move to a different activity, move to a different place, go where people are, um, do something. So it's this thing that happens where you avoid the place, but if by chance that thing happens, in five seconds you say no, and while you're doing that five seconds of saying no, you're thinking of Christmas morning or whatever it is, you're holding on to that, you're feeling the emotion of that, and you're already getting up and getting ready to, do to move else. somewhere else. And it's just such a proactive way of like, getting past what's going on in your life. So we love that idea. And it's just neat that it's this scriptural advice. Like mm -hmm. all of this comes from like, this is how God knows what the troubles of mortality are. And it's just neat that he's this trusted source of someone who's like guiding us and like, okay, this is what the Lord has said. Yeah. What if we actually did it? I think it could work. Yeah. So Jacob's going to do the same thing. So this is a really good pattern that we see that we, we look at a modern day need 
and we we see an answer that would work for that. Jacob is going to do that same thing. We're going to watch this happen um, in three and four. And there's going to be two things that happen here. Um, in my scripture, I've labeled both of these chapters with like a chapter heading. Sometimes I like to do that. So chapter three, I've named living vertically. And chapter four, I've named looking beyond the mark. So those are the two things we want to be careful of. And and we've given you both of those. This is going to be... Well, not careful. Careful of li looking beyond the mark. Yeah, and, and good, good at, at living, living vertically. vertically. Um, and we're going to set both of those up just so you can see kind of what they look like um, on this paper. So we're going to start with living vertically. What does it look like? And it seems like he's addressing those people who've been like had their hearts broken because of the sins of somebody else. And that would be a great spot in scripture for like, oh, I've been cheated on. I've been let down. I've, I've been, been wronged. What, yeah, wronged. But it also is just great for any situation. Mm -hmm. It just happens to be that kind of situation right here. And if you'll look in verses 1 and 2, chapter right 3, here. verses on, 1 and 2, so he kind of gives a list of here's how, you know, yeah. to handle like a broken heart. And, and, and you just look, and he says, Look unto God with firmness of mind, and pray unto him with exceeding faith or trust, or just, you mm -hmm. know, just to pray. I love number three. He says, Lift up your head. Um, uh, who, who was that talk? Oh, President Monson's talk, remember? Or about President Monson, like, look up. Like, yeah. lift up your head and start feeling hope and start thinking of, of things that are good. Because you can really like get into the drudgery. Um, four is receive the pleasing word of God. Did I say that right? I think so. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah, the pleasing word of God. Yep. Um, what has he said? That's just like oh, that's like a like a like a refreshment to the soul. Feast upon his love. Oh, I love that one so much because I want to say this: if you are broken hearted, if you're in that place right now. Generally, what you're feeling is a loss of love, right? It just, that's when things are broken, mm. that's your number one question. And I love that he's like, this is not an aside. Like, he's like, I want you to feast on God's love. I want you to go to the one who loves you truly and purely and no matter what. And besides everything else that's happening, like you hold on to that love and just let it fill you all the way up, all those broken parts, let it just seep in there. And and maybe if this is you, you want to just go through and read the whole scriptures of what can you learn about the love of God? How does it work? How will he manifest that in your life? What could you be watching for? How would you engage with him in a way that would allow that love to become part of what you need for your healing? Yeah. And then number six is to keep your minds firm. Thoughts and emotions can go so rampant and wild. And it's like his advice is keep your thoughts. Like don't let those other thoughts mm -hmm. invade. This is what's actually true about you. This is what's true about the situation. And keep your minds firm on, on those truths. And the title for that, to live vertically, is so fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it really is going to go with this next one. Yep. You know, but the, it's the whole idea of like every single one of these is... Like, not, I'm not looking this way and trying to s compare and solve the problem like this, but I'm looking to God mm -hmm. for it. Um, I, we love as you get into Jacob 4, and we're going to go into this moment where he's just going to talk about, let's talk about first, like, he, he goes through and he lists, this is what the problem is. In case you don't know what the problem is, let me just help you to know what the problem is. And we're going to find that problem um, in 14 through, um, what did we say, through 17. That's where you want to look. And it's interesting because think about these words. They were stiff-necked. They despised the words of plainness. They killed the prophets. Um, they sought for things that they could not understand. I think that is so interesting. Like, what, why are you trying to figure out things that you... We're just not going to understand that right now. That's just true about some things. Um, their blindness came because of looking beyond the mark. Um that the, it, it could have been so plain, and yet they were making it um, so hard. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it says that they, they stumbled, and then they ended up rejecting God himself because they were so, like, just caught up in, in all of this other stuff. And they missed 
what the mark was. So the mark is just like kind of like a bullseye. Like you mm-hmm. missed what this was actually about. You were so focused on all the peripheral questions and concerns that those monopolized your thoughts and your feelings and you missed what everything was yeah, actually which all is about. Jesus Christ, right? I love at the very beginning what Jacob told us. Remember, think about his death. Think about taking up his cross. Think about like the mark is just come back to thinking about Jesus Christ. Who is he? What did his sacrifice mean for you? How could you be using his grace in your life to to make you better, to magnify you, to increase your capacity. How can you find rest in that relationship? This is the simple thing that he's talking about. And um, it's interesting because he's going to give us a couple just easy go-tos. And we love in... Starting in like verse 5. Yep, and then in verse 6. Yeah, where he's just like, look... Um, he starts talking about those who ha- were firm and the word he's going to use is unshaken. So at the end of the chapter, he's going to talk about these people rejected and stumbled. Let me show you what it looked like for a person to become unshaken. And it wasn't just grit and it didn't mean they didn't have questions. It means that they lived vertically. Verse and, five. Oh, go ahead. Oh yeah. Say five and then I'll Well, I was going to say, it says they believed in Christ. There it is again. They worshiped the Father. Worshiped means emulate. It also means to love and set your affections on. Um, oh, I just didn't, I'm buttoning myself here. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and he said, and the whole purpose of the law of Moses, like he said, a lot of people, they got caught up in like, why did God ask us to do this? And why are we supposed to do this? And are we supposed to do this all the time? And I think you're supposed to do this all the time. And he's like, you missed the mark. The whole purpose of it was to point your souls to Christ. To get yourself settled on him. To be sanctified um, by him. Mm -hmm. Uh, Look for the things that are a similitude of him. He's like, obviously, like people probably like interpreted the law wrong and used it as a beating stick against others. And we're people, which means this whole system is going to be like, you're going to find flaws and messiness in it. And he says like, in all of that, it's okay to work through it. But don't live in the peripheral. Make sure your heart and mind are set on the mark, which is Jesus. And I love that in verse 6, he's going to say how he became unshaken. How faith can become unshaken. And it's so simple. He says this, wherefore we search the prophets. Okay, what does that mean? There's going to be three things. We search the prophets. Where where would you search the prophets if you were going to do that today? And it's going to be in the words of scripture and it's going to be in general conference and it's going to be in the little emails President Nelson keeps wanting to send us to be like, oh, I've been thinking lately about this, right? I love that he's like, let me connect with you. Let me engage with you. Let's have these conversations more often than just every six months. The second thing is he said, we have many revelations. Um, Okay. Sometimes you might read that and you'll be like, well, he was a prophet, so of course he had revelations. And what I want to say to that is we have a prophet who has told all of us we do not understand the privilege of revelation in our life. And I think what Jacob is saying is how is revelation working for you? What does it look like? Because is it you should be experiencing that on the regular. Like that should be happening in your life right now. If you are not sure how revelation works, I'm going to invite you, and let's put this in a link. Um, Elder Bednar just gave a great talk on Revelation. That it, It's going to a little bit shift your thinking about how Revelation works. And um, if you search the talk, it's going to be a broadcast. You can find it if you go to um, the church website under broadcast, and you want to look under other broadcasts. And um, the broadcast was called, what? What do you hear that I didn't say or something like that? But don't worry, we will link it in the newsletter so you can find it. And if you don't know how to get the newsletter, it's at emilybellfreeman.com, bell with an E at the end of it. Um, But what you're going to love about that broadcast is because in that email from President Nelson where it says, we've got an invitation from the Father to hear him, which is encouraging. mm -hmm. It's not just an invitation, but it's encouraging, like meaning you can. You can be a 14-year-old farm kid. And, and you can hear him. And that's what's cool about Elder yeah. Bednar's thing is it makes it's, it so simple. It does. It's, it makes it's it so simple. It's not complicated. 
So Revelation that's the second sounds thing. so complicated. Right. It's and, so easy. And, and that's simple. the second thing. We've got to be living in Revelation. We've got to figure out what that looks like for us. And the third thing he talks about is the spirit of prophecy. And remember, we read about in the book of Revelation, the spirit of pro- prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So what are you doing right now that is strengthening your testimony of Jesus? I love that those are his three things because then he's like, okay, this is what I'm doing. I'm searching the prophets. I'm having many revelations and the spirit of prophecy. And because of that, I obtain a hope and our faith becometh unshaken. Um, I love that. Mm-hmm. That's the answer. That's the answer to faith becoming unshaken. Um, and I, that's a good place really to end. It's just that thought of um, w- what can we learn from Jacob in these first four chapters is he's talking about trying to overcome a culture and a tradition and the beginning of, um, of this road that is going to lead you away from Christ. How, how do we come back to the mark? Um, yeah, because we have our own things. It's not yeah. the law of Moses, but it's different things. And go all the way through um, 13. Yeah. Okay, Verse we just did 5 and 6, but all the way through 13, there's just so much advice in there and how to keep a heart centered on him. And and let, can, let, can I just say this? I just got this text um, when I got here to the house, and it was a friend of mine. I love this 11 where he just says, because seven talks about think more about grace and mm-hmm. 11 talks about be reconciled unto him through the atonement of Christ. And 12, I mean, that's 11 and 12 says, why not speak of the atonement of Christ? Oh, it's and so good. I walked in and my friend texted me and says, Hey, do you know so-and-so? And I was like, yeah, I, I think, isn't that so-and-so's brother? And he said, yeah, he's a, he, I don't, he said, he used to be a wild man. And I said, Oh, I know of him. And then he said this to me, God changed him so much. He is a new creature. Oh, he says, I ran into him today and it makes me wonder what happened. And I was like, that, I just love the thought of like, that's where I want my conversation. I love other ones about questions Mm -hmm. and all of our things that are messy and stuff, but let's keep coming back to, let's keep coming back to that. And to Jesus. And that's what I mean. That end 12. Why not speak of the atonement of Christ and attain to a perfect knowledge of him? It's just such a good place to stay centered yeah so good one such a good one next time so good we can't wait yeah you can't (laughs) wait for next week